Welcome back into Bill's Chat on the Built-In Buffalo Podcast Network. I am Josh McCarty. With me, as always, is Luca. Luca, how are you doing tonight? Doing good. It was a long weekend. Had family in town. A wedding shower uh, for my beautiful soon bride-to-be, or bride-to-be, whatever. Yeah, I said that like crap. But anyways, it was a busy day today, um, stuff like that. Kind of excited to relax and sit down and uh, kind of wrap up this draft season and give our stuff and takes and everything on the picks that we finally know are done, signed, sealed, and delivered, and uh, see what we have to say. And honestly, hear what you got to say, because it was such a busy weekend that I don't even know how you feel about the draft. Yeah, the last time I talked to Luca, well, I mean, we chatted throughout the day on Friday and Saturday, just sending texts back and forth in Discord. But the last time we were talking to each other verbally was on the live show, which I would encourage any of you if you hadn't seen it. It was it was a blast. We had Stokes. We had several guests, Kristen Kimmick from uh, the Bills Mafia Babes, a few folks from Built in Buffalo, Peter DiBiase, T. Estelle. Uh, Lance was on there with us. Um, but uh, we had Joe DeRosa from Cover One. Really good time. Got to see our reaction live to all the picks, including when the Bills traded up and ended up selecting Dalton Kincaid. So I really enjoyed that. I, I hope it's something we do next year. But what's interesting about that moment, Luca, is the draft is like a book. And the what we had access to on night one of the draft was chapter one. Now, it's a big chapter. It's your most important asset. But I really feel like to grade a draft class and even to grade a draft pick, you have to know what the team did the rest of the way. So it's very possible that the way we felt about Dalton Kincaid on Friday or on Thursday, excuse me, changed after we saw what the Bills did with the rest of the pick. If, if you if there is probably somebody out there that was mad they took Dalton Kincaid because Osiris Torrance was on the board, that's probably somebody that exists. And so by the time Friday rolls around, they're feeling a lot better about the Kincaid pick. So what I'm excited about tonight is to go into all these picks, talk about the roles we envision for these players year one and moving forward, and really just talk about how we like the pick, how we like the fit, and what we're thinking about what the Bills' strategy was in this draft. But man, Luca, this, this draft season was a grind, and I, I don't want to speak for you, but I am just ready to kind of take a little bit of a deep breath here tonight and just... Talk about it and then let it breathe. Yeah, the draft season, as fun as it always is, and I look forward to 2024, especially kind of giving that early look towards the prospects and what it looks like it'll break down. To me, right now, it looks more exciting. I think there's a lot more high-end talent there that we're going to be able to discuss. But coming back to this year's draft and the process and everything that we have been able to do for all of you to listen to us and whatnot, I'm right there with you. I'm ready for it to be over with. I'm, I'm excited for this episode and I like to just kind of bounce things. You know, you and I have a conversation about everything we feel about this draft, but also, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to a little bit of a cut from all of this, a little bit of a break, make sure we don't get burnt out and everything like that. I do have a wedding coming up very shortly that I'm excited to come and also go because the stress level of that is just elevating by the hour. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm excited for this to kind of put a nice, beautiful bow on top of this year's draft season on the 2023 draft, give our takes on all of this. And I, I agree with you. I think it's fascinating now coming from the live stream where we saw the Dalton Kincaid pick gave our opinions, which, you know, if you want to hear them, as Josh said, check them out, the live reactions and everything we did when it came to also the quick hits episode that we filmed basically right on the spot afterwards. You take that and then all of a sudden you go into day two and you see us take Osiris Torrance, as you mentioned, and even uh, Dorian Williams. And then you take day three, so on and so forth. Now we can kind of really give it a more outsider's perspective on this is how the entire draft broke down. How do we feel about everything even going back to the Kincaid pick? So, yeah, I'm excited for this episode, excited to put that bow on top, get this thing done and dusted and kind of enjoy the break that is this part of the NFL offseason, hopefully, and then eventually the uh, pre, you know, training camp and everything will be right around the corner soon enough. It'll be here before we know it. So what we're going to do tonight is we are going to go through and give our grades on each individual pick. And these grades are going to be based on knowing what the next picks are. So factoring into my grade on Dalton Kincaid will be the knowledge of what they did in rounds two, three, four, five, five, six, seven, as it went on. So just for those, if you happen to miss it, we'll catch you up real quick. Here's what the bills came away with in this draft In round one, pick 25, they drafted Dalton Kincaid, tight end out of Utah State. Out of round two, they drafted Osiris Torrance, offensive guard from the University of Florida. 
In round three, they got a linebacker, Dorian Williams from the University of Tulane. Uh, in round five, they took wide receiver Justin Florida back from the University of Florida. And then in round seven, they had two picks. The first one was pick 230, offensive lineman Nick Broker from Ole Miss, and then pick 252, cornerback Alex Austin from Oregon State. Did Jordan Poyer proud going to his alma mater? Luca, let's start with the first one. Dalton Kincaid. And what a wild ride the first round was. When you look at how players were coming off the board, it wasn't until pick 20 that the first wide receiver came off the board, Jackson Smith and Jigba going to the Seattle Seahawks. But then right after that, Luca, it was bing, bang, boom. Next four picks were wide receivers, JSN, Quinton Johnson, Zay Flowers, and Jordan Addison. And at that point in time, you felt you went from a point of, wow, the Bills are in really good shape here at wide receiver to, oh my gosh, they, they just missed the wide receiver run. It was, it was, uh, I mean, if you watch the live stream, you understand, but if you didn't and you want kind of a cliff notes or just kind of, it was a wild roller coaster moment right there before JSN inevitably went at 20, because at that point it was almost, we didn't know what was set to come. And Josh, I believe that was the exact moment where you're like, as bills fans, you see the board as it is. How are we feeling with no receivers taken? Like we had that literal conversation live on the spot as the draft is happening. And little did you myself or anyone know the next four picks would be that run at wide receivers that we've all kind of been talking about through this entire process. And it was just, it was wild because at that point in time, right before the Seahawks pick, I did have this inkling like JSN has to be going here or if somehow he fell to 21 at the Chargers, even though I was very confident that they would go Quentin Johnston myself, I was like they would take JSN, I would imagine at that point because the value is just too good at the receiver position, which it really sounded like they wanted. So um, I was like, there's going to be one at least gone, maybe two, because there are other teams there as well, like the Ravens and so on and so forth that like you could understand it. You know, the Vikings who also obviously took Addison. So when we got to the end of that, though, when it became a reality that four came, it was just like, OK, now what? What what are the bills going to do here? Just, you know, where what was it about 45 minutes ago we had that conversation where it's like wow we're sitting in a great spot if you like wide receivers here because none are off the board and this is crazy to think that not even jsn was taken up to that point at pick 20 so just crazy crazy time so we get to pick 25 and the bills trade up there on the clock and they send a fourth round pick along with pick 27 to get the jaguars pick at 25 to take dalton kincaid and at the time we were on the air and we, we knew they were on the clock. We knew they had trade up. We were trying to put the pieces together. And I went back and listened to the live stream because I wanted to hear what we said. And we were on board with, um, we talked about Smith, the defensive end that the, the, uh, the Eagles ended up getting, we talked about Mozzie Smith, who was a top 30 visitor. But I will tell you at one point in time during that, we said, why would they trade ahead of Dallas? And Dallas is hot after tight ends and all the tight ends were available. And then we did kick around Dalton Kincaid along with Michael Mayer. They went with Dalton Kincaid. He is the best receiving tight end in this class. He runs routes like a wide receiver. He has great zone awareness. Brandon Bean called him almost like Cole Beasley in a tight end's body with his awareness for how to get open. And at the time, I really liked this pick. It, it came through with my reaction on the air because at that point, the way the board fell, I was thinking, okay, well, this didn't work out too well for the Bills. They're going to go ahead and address defensive tackle or linebacker, and they didn't. They got Josh Allen a weapon, and I love the fact that they didn't reach down the wide receiver board, even though there were still some guys there we liked. Instead of going for maybe the fourth or fifth wide receiver in a Jalen Hyatt or a Josh Downs, they were like, no, we're going to take the blue chip tight end that some mock drafts have going as early as 12th overall, and then you see Daniel Jeremiah talk about how the NFL just let Dalton Kincaid fall to the bills to catch passes from Josh Allen. It deserves everything it gets. And PFF said it was one of their favorite picks in the entire draft. So I've had some time to sleep on it. Obviously I have not cooled on my love of this pick. I think he is an instant starter in their slot. I think the bills are going to run a lot of two tight end sets. Um, we'll get into grades here in a second, but what did you think about the Dalton Kincaid pick or what do you think about the Dalton Kincaid pick? So real quick, live, 
I liked it a lot. I thought it was an exciting pick, I guess is the way to put it. It's, it's sexy in a little bit of a way, but at the same time, kind of sleeping on it now and stuff like that. I don't mean this in any disrespectful way to the pick or me saying like, I like it any less per se, but it almost became like the best possible luxury pick they could have made there. And again, I want to say that because I'm not being disrespectful in that way. It's just like, it doesn't really address any glaring need on the surface. You know, when you come to like positional needs or anything like that, but then when you dig a little bit deeper and you understand where his skill sets are, where he could potentially thrive on this team and why even a Josh Allen would be very excited, which it sounds like he is to get a Dalton Kincaid. I even wrote it in my notes. It's like when you dig a little bit deeper and you add this guy, what it really seems like he's going to do. It's not like people are pointing out like the Beasley role, the Beasley role and fill that void. That was clearly there. I think you even have to be more specific than that. It's fill the 2020 Beasley role because what he has the ability to do is not only find those pockets of space and just be that safety blanket underneath. And you know, Beasley of 2021 would maybe get you five, six yards. The 2020 Beasley was actually breaking out some big plays in those moments on top of that, even when taking the underneath catches, not even just the intermediate down the field where he was finding those pockets. He could actually turn up field and make big plays happen. I think that's the next thing that Dalton Kincaid can do. He can bring that production back so that that run after catch and stuff like that, that we were seeing a little bit of out of Beasley in 2020 can return to this offense because it, it like to me, it was obviously the the most exciting part about 2020 was the emergence of Josh Allen finally and just seeing this MVP like quarterback in front of us finally right there and having an incredible year. But I think what was underrated about that was the fact that Beasley was a massive part of that. And then in 2021, the reason that it was still amazing how well Josh Allen was doing was the fact that that was gone. Like Beasley was still doing his own and not bad, but it wasn't nearly as close as what we saw before. So it really was just digs heavy. And then everyone else kind of by committee where you had Gabe Beasley and everyone else doing their individual roles a little bit here and there. So I think Kincaid as a pick is really that 2020 Beasley role just for one more time. And it's going to be exciting. Also real quick, Josh, my I've got some feedback. They would love colleges next to these people, which you did when you first said them. So I'm going to just make sure shout out to the individual. You know who you are. Don Kincaid out of Utah. Every time I mention a player going forward, if it sounds weird that I'm forcing in the college, I'm doing this for someone that told me this. So don't, you don't have to do this, Josh. I'm, I'm just going to do this because I got that feedback. Don I, Kincaid, think I, I think I said Utah state in my introduction too. So yeah, oh, brutal Utah, the yeah, Utes. Utah, definitely the Utes. Uh, I will also point it out now. If anyone's listening at this point, we're 12 minutes in. And he did say Justin, Florida, out of the University of Florida. Shout out! It is shorter. All right, I got it. Let me uh, let me check my notes real quick because what what did I do here? Justin Shorter University. So you wrote my it notes, right, but you my said notes Florida. are good. My brain yeah. is bad. Right. Um, it's, right. My brain is mush. Um, let's talk a little bit about the position. So yeah. historically, tight end has been one of those positions where the transition to the NFL can be a little rough. Even a historic level prospect like Kyle Pitts had trouble hitting the ground running. What I think the Bills can do to speed up Dalton Kincaid's usage here and really have him help them in a significant way in year one, simplify the process for him. And the Bills have some luxuries that most teams that have taken tight ends in round one don't have. One, they have a franchise quarterback that, quite honestly, only four or five teams in the league really have. Two, they already have a tight end in Dawson Knox, so they don't need Dalton Kincaid to go in there and do all the dirty work that tight ends have to deal with. My vision for him this year, Luca, is to really be that big slot. The reason why tight ends struggle to acclimate to the NFL, when you think about what's all on their plate, when they're lining up in line, they not only have to read the defense as far as, oh, wait, is this linebacker coming? Because if he comes, I'm going to stay in and block. Or on this particular play, Am I supposed to go out and all of a sudden I'm the hot read? And that's just a lot to digest when you're acclimating yourself to NFL speed and you're trying to understand different blocking techniques and you're trying to understand route concepts and option routes, all of that. For Dalton Kincaid, I would almost fully expect the Bills to say, for 2023, you are a receiver. You are our slot receiver. We want you to focus on being a receiver. Will there be plays where we motion you in like we saw with Gabe Davis last year to help block in line. I'm sure that will happen where there'll be packages. 
where he lines up in line. I'm sure that will happen. But for the majority of the snaps, he will be lining up out wide, lined up on either a defensive back that he's bigger than or a linebacker that he's more athletic than. And it can be, I'm not telling you that every time he's on the field, they're going to throw the ball. That would be dumb. I'm telling you that he will still be responsible for blocking like any wide receiver would be on a certain play, but simplify what he has to do year one. And I think he can help you in a mega, mega way. It's that's a very, very good point. And it's kind of like we're in a similar mindset here where I'm talking about the production he can add to this offense. And it was that kind of similar uh, slot role. And you're just even saying it, you know, double down. And I agree 100 percent. It's like make it easy for him. Use him at his best where his skill set that you just drafted him because of at best points. Like you said, please don't tip your plays and just only pass when he's out there. But overall, right, just make it easy for him. Make sure he's not having to overthink everything because the worst thing you could do out there is be thinking about everything instead of just letting your kind of natural abilities and just doing things subconsciously just happen for you. And overall, it can work out very, very well and a lead down the line where he can get into those intricacies of the position and eventually develop as a player it at the NFL level when the time comes right now you just want to try to get him as comfortable as possible and just make things easy for him so yeah i agree with you that's a very very smart way and hopefully that you know is what they kind of go with we'll get into grades here in a second i do want you know we're going to spend more time on kincaid and towards probably than the rest of the guys because this is where the meat of the guys that we think are going to come in and help the bills out year one um one other thing i want to ask you about kincaid for this pick to be a success what kind of role does he need to have in your mind Luca we just talked about you know big slot all that but let's talk more about just percentages because the bills historically under with with Josh Allen Ken Dorsey even back to Brian Dable have been a 11 personnel team which is three wide receivers and what we're talking about here is more 12 personnel two tight end with really what Brandon Bean called 11 and a half personnel which I thought was kind of interesting where Kincaid's on the field. He's kind of a wide receiver. He's also a tight end. It can really put the defense in a bind. How do you match up with it? But I would tell you that if you traded up for this player in the first round, you spent a first round pick on him. You, you targeted him to add to your offense. Your franchise quarterback is texting the GM, telling him how excited he is. I think it's a fail if he's only on the field at the end of the year, barring injury for 30% of the snaps and he's getting two or three targets a game. I think this needs to be your new primary offense, your new base package, if you will, on offense. And with that, I'll also add this. That puts the pressure on Ken Dorsey to find ways to utilize this because we saw last year, to a lesser extent, Naheem Hines, James Cook come in, being described as these um, movement players on offense that can really be matchup nightmares, chess pieces, if you will, and they just never got involved in the passing game like we envisioned them. And now they'd spend a first round pick on a moving chess piece. And I'm interested to see what Ken Dorsey can cook up here, because if everything goes right, this can be an absolute nightmare of a mismatch for opposing defenses that are going to be constantly trying to figure out, do we go nickel? Do we go base? The same conundrum the Patriots put you in when they had Gronkowski and Hernandez No, I am not calling Dawson Knox Gronkowski, but it's the same idea. And that Patriots team did not have a digs, by the way. Um, But it can really put you in a bind. And if if it all goes well, this Bills team can be a headache. I just wonder with this pick and them being aggressive to get it. They like him. They wanted to bring him in. They wanted to bring in that kind of guy into this offense. If there wasn't already something, and we pointed out this before in previous episodes and even just on the live stream when we were you know, talking about it after the pick, or maybe even mentioned it before, where um, you know, our final thoughts on it, even we talked about OJ Howard and how they brought him in last offseason, and maybe they even had this part of the playbook drawn up with him in mind and doing that 12 personnel and then because of unfortunately him not working out in the preseason letting him go and stuff you essentially had to put that aside like is it just sitting on the shelf now where you know dorsey immediately just reached over as soon as the pick was made dusted it off and was like all right we're going to try to implement this now with this individual in there and i don't know if there's necessarily a percentage i could put on this when it comes to pass fail success failure and stuff like that but i think 
the number you just threw out there is a pretty solid one when it comes to 30% as being just kind of a baseline gray area where it's like, yes, you would like to see him out there a lot more. I just think bringing in an individual like him, I don't know what percentage you would have to accomplish that to make it a true success. What I would say is it just has to be noticeable. I don't know what that number needs to be, but it needs to be noticeable. And what I mean by that essentially is you are watching a, a, an effort being made when it comes to changing looks, changing personnel, getting different looks to that defense and inevitably finding out what works while it's, you know, whether it's coming during the week into the game or live on the spot, you re realize your 11 personnel isn't working. You bring in the 12 personnel, it's working, and then you just ride it in the second half or vice versa. Like, that's my other thing. I think if all of a sudden you see them go away from it because, say, the Jets are doing a great job handling 12 personnel with Knox and Kincaid, which had worked the previous week against whoever, it's like don't be afraid to then go away from it and then go to your 11 personnel and try something else. That's the point to me of this pick. You now are opening up other available options when it comes to different looks, different designs, things you can do with that and then create those mismatches off of that. I think it even does it more so just because defenses I feel like are going to match up a lot more differently when it comes to tight end compared to wide receiver rather than halfback and, you know, two tight ends. So 12 personnel in that case, or two, you know, split back in the backfield. I think halfbacks play less of a role in that than say a tight end who has the abilities like him. And then all of a sudden you trot out a true traditional, more like wide receiver in that slot. So that to me is where success if they do that throughout the entire season like if you do the entire season where you're really playing around with that 11 12 whatever you need to do to get him involved but then also just create confusion on the other side that to me is success if they try doing that early and all of a sudden pull it you know pull it back and they just go to good old trusty 11 personnel and it's just a lot more of what we've been seeing that to me then starts to get into the failure point of this pick all right, it's grade time. Let's see what kind of grade we give Dalton Kincaid. I'll go first on this one. I'm going to give this pick an A minus. And the only reason I'm going to give it a minus is I don't love having to trade up in the first round, but I do firmly believe what Brandon Bean said that Dallas would have taken uh, Dalton Kincaid. Um, and the other reason I'm going to give it an A minus is the Bills are being graded as the Bills, not just on Dalton Kincaid. And I need to see Ken Dorsey show that he can utilize this weapon. So that minus there is certainly the potential to get better. And this has a chance to be an A plus pick. But for now, given the fact that they traded up, I'm dinging them slightly, although probably had to do it to get this player. And they did recover as the draft went on. I do have access to that. They did end up with six picks and a couple of future picks, which I am a big fan of. A minus. I think that's a strong grade, by the way, because as far as I'm concerned, A minus is a really good grade. And um, that's where I'm at. I feel really good about this pick. And I can tell you, Luca, after having time to think about it, there's nothing else that was available to the Bills at pick 25 that I would have preferred them to do. Um, and I, I know we're big fans of Nolan Smith, but at the end of the day, it was about getting a weapon for Josh Allen. This entire offseason has been weaponizing Josh Allen. All due respect to Deontay Hardy, Trent Sherfield, Damian Harris. Those are nice players. The Bills need a significant investment in the offensive side of the ball, and they hadn't drafted a first-round offensive player since Josh Allen. So I applaud this. I applaud the move. I applaud the thought process. Now make, make it go from an A- minus to an A by executing it properly. So you said a lot of great points there, and I, I don't need to really kind of reciprocate them because I do share a lot of those points. What I will say is this. I think – a couple different things that I don't share with you uh, is kind of my thought of I could you could have easily sold me just as well on drafting Nolan Smith there as Dalton Kincaid. I think it would have been a very comparable swap for swap. And my grade could have been, like if I sat here and we did end up taking edge Nolan Smith from Georgia, I probably would have the same grade, to be quite honest. Um, and I'll get to that in a second. But then the other point I make is, and I brought it up earlier, it's not necessarily a massive negative thing, but it just felt like a great luxury pick. It wasn't necessarily filling any drastic need. Yes, it's a weapon for Josh Allen and it can create things, but in the same mindset of kind of what you said to piggyback off of it, I haven't seen enough from Dorsey to feel like now you brought in this thing and I'm confident that it's going to be used properly. 
and I know it's going to work out and guaranteed be great. And that's where then the luxury aspect of it creates a little bit of a question mark to me. It's nothing about the player. It's more about how you will end up being utilized and stuff. So it's like, okay, if that ultimately you used a first round pick for someone that you don't even know what you're going to ultimately do with, that's where questions are being raised. And I really, really wonder why you even did that in the first place when you could have utilized, say, a Nolan Smith, where I would have more confidence they would know what to do with. So overall, my grade, though, is a B plus in a similar mindset, though. It's like it's a plus because this really could be an A minus. This could be an A pick. I just I need to see it first. I need to see I I'll even say it like I need to see preseason. I don't even need to sec- necessarily see regular season because preseason is not what they're going to ultimately run in the regular season, of course, offensively. But if I'm seeing him go out there and they are at least running a lot of 12 personnel or just I see different things out there, even if it's base plays and nothing fancy, then all of a sudden you could probably even see me thinking that it was an A minus style pick going into the regular season. I just have to see it first before giving it any sort of A letter grade. I need to see Joe Biscaglia and Matt Perino and Heather Prusak and all those that cover the Bills training camp tweeting out daily that Dalton Kincaid is going to be very involved in this offense based on what they're seeing in the practices. That is step one. It's very important. I'm right there with you. Uh, Brandon Bean in his history of being Buffalo Bills GM up until this year had never drafted a player in the first round that was older than the age of 21, had never drafted a player in the first round that didn't come on a top 30 visit. Dalton Kincaid, 23 years old and didn't come on a top 30 visit. We'll revisit that after we're done with the grades. Okay, in round two, the Bills come up at pick 59, and they come away with a guy that had been mocked quite frequently to the Bills in the in the first round. Offensive lineman Osiris Torrance from the University of Florida, whoever likes that out there. Um, this was an interesting pick. Luca, you and I were talking through text live as this happened, so I will be candid with all of you. Torrance was not my favorite idea at the time. I, I thought that, wow, you got Dalton Kincaid in the first round and Jalen Hyatt falls into your lap. I think that that was my favorite idea because I still am concerned about the fact that Stefan Diggs is going to be 30 years old and Gabe, Gabe Davis is going into his contract year and we still want to see more from him. And I just thought it was a good chance to add a unique skill set to the pipeline. And having already added Kincaid, Hyatt could now come in and really be more of a role player year one and grow while he develops his route tree. But it's hard to argue the value here, Luca, when you get a player at pick 59 that was commonly mocked in the first, you know, 35, 40 picks. You saw him go in the first round of mock drafts. And I will say, um, well, I don't want to talk. We're going to go back and forth on this, but I'll say one other thing that kind of confused me was they went out and gave a pretty hefty contract to Connor McGovern. Two years ago, they gave a pretty hefty contract to Ryan Bates to match the offer sheet from Chicago. They already signed David Edwards from the Rams, who is considered a pretty high-end backup guard, and they still have Mitch Morse on their team. I did not go into this draft thinking that they viewed interior offensive line as a need. So I would say that this is clearly a best player available pick, and for that, I applaud them because I don't think you need to handcuff yourself to a list of immediate needs when you are drafting players for not just this year, the next five to 10 years. Yeah, this is BPA. This pick to me and the reason I will like it as much as I do when we get to the grade point is so weighted heavily on BPA because it's, it was funny. We, we had a little bit of back and forth as the picks were developing, getting up to 59 where all of a sudden I went from regular standard text to all caps to a lot of excited all caps to you. It was blowing up your phone to a point where I actually had a thought in my mind where I'm like, I'm hoping I'm not pissing them off as I send these on blast nonstop as I was playing Chell or whatever I was doing. I can't remember what I was doing at the time, to be honest. But, um, you know, I'm watching the draft progress as it was, and it was just like, holy crap, there's all these different options. There's downs, there's Hyatt, there's like, this is all happening. Like, it's happening. Like, this is incredible. Drew Sanders. Yeah, Drew, Drew Sanders. Like, we're yeah. going to have the pick of the litter. Like, anything's going to happen. And I think you even mentioned it. I could even see them trading down because of how many people are currently sitting there right now that we could easily see the Bills taking. And I, I genuinely totally forgot to even fully look at the draft board, see who is sitting there. The pick goes in, and I see Osiris Torrance. 
And I'm like, wow. Like it was, it was a letdown just because of everyone sitting there. But then when I really sat back and thought about it, I'm like, that's an incredible value pick. Like I didn't even realize he was there because I'll like, I'll admit it. I don't pay attention to offensive linemen too closely after the first round. Like I, I'm not looking at those guys. They're not the sexy guys. Like, why, why am I looking at no, no offense, to offensive linemen out there, but it's just, that's not where my head's at anymore. Cause I'm just excited to see where, you know, fantasy purpose wise, whatever it is, I'm excited to see the wide receivers, the tight ends, the running backs and all these guys go. And we're now looking at the bills here and it's a lot of different guys we've linked them to and stuff like that. But then on top of it, as you also said, like I didn't understand interior offensive line to ever be a concern there, but when the value is so good, you have to do it. You have to pull the trigger. I don't care what position it is. You have to take that guy. And for that alone, I'm with you on it. Like I was very happy with this pick once I finally kind of let the disappointment of Jalen Hyatt or Josh Downs not being a Buffalo Bill while sitting there at 59, which thought was impossible going into the draft weekend. Um it was like, okay, I fully understand this. I can grasp this. And even as you said, like, to me, I was like, I don't know if David Edwards is going to be here after the season and stuff like that. you like, I don't know where all these other guys, you still have, you know, uh, I'm trying to even think of other names. Like you basically Bocker. have the big three. Yeah. Bocker mm-hmm. and stuff like, like, I'm not even concerned about those guys. It's like, you really just have McGovern Bates and then now Torrance. And then Mitch Morse also came into it immediately in my head where it's like, okay, now we like, and we can have this conversation, but it's like, okay, if the thought process was even on top of it, that Bates will eventually become Morse's successor because there is that end of the line coming for Morse. It seems like then Torres Torrance slots in McGovern's still there and you're good. Like you, you honestly are in a better position than it thought because go last season, we always kept saying like if Dawkins and or Morse went down, it really felt like we were screwed big time on the offensive line. And this mm-hmm. creates incredible flexibility now where if one guy goes down, you don't feel nearly as bad anymore because you're sacrificing something massive due to Greg Mance having to come in or whatever it might be. Like there's actually a lot of nice playability that this opens up to. And it was funny. Like I kept sitting there and these thoughts kept cross- crossing my mind. And then eventually, lastly, right before I kick it to you, I remember you were kind of like, mauling it over how you felt about it and i was like remember everything we thought about when we initially signed um god saffold Saffold. Saffold, thank you when we brought in a guy like saffold and we're like this is a great signing because of what he will be able to provide and everything like that that's exactly where i was like okay this kind of fits that description but we're not getting an aging veteran who hopefully it's just he can still do this for us it's like he's young and hungry hopefully and he actually can be that kind of mauler guy for us and it's like okay i'm i'm in like i'm sold i I love everything about this pick top to bottom incredible pick at 59 to fall into your lap yeah and it took me by surprise because what the bills have looked for recently in interior offensive linemen is athletes Saffold was a very high end athlete. Um, Ryan Bates is a 10 or close to 10 on the RAS score. Even when you look at what they did with Spencer Brown and Tommy Doyle, they broke the RAS system. Those guys are so athletic. Um, Connor McGovern, freakish athlete, played fullback for Dallas a lot in certain packages. So you and I, despite the fact that the Bills had Torrance on a top 30 visit, the whole time leading up to the draft, anytime somebody would ask us about Torrance, our response would be, I think he's a good player. I'm not sure he fits what the bills are looking for. So I knew he was on the board. He just, he never came into my mind as I was cycling through what I thought the bills were going to do in that spot. Quite honestly, I thought drew Sanders was going to be the pick. I thought that was somebody they would have strongly considered a pick 27 and he falls into your lap. You, you address middle linebacker. I think I told you, I think they're going to pick drew Sanders. I want them to pick Jalen Hyatt. And then when they took Osiris Torrance, it was a quick processing second of like, wow, I didn't expect that. And it's not like it's not because it was a reach. It's because it's not like when they took Terrell Bernard two years ago and all of a sudden I'm flipping through my magazine, like not my magazine. <laughs> what, what year is this? Oh, um, flipping through my phone looking for like, wait, Terrell Bernard, isn't he fifth or sixth round value? Um, no, I mean, everybody knew Osiris Torrance and, you know, road grading guard, but just you, you always envision him going to a team like Seattle or Baltimore, a team that really prioritizes s- s- size and power, and they want to build their foundation around a power running game, Philadelphia. 
Um, so I have a couple thoughts on maybe a big picture conversation, but I will just tell you, Luca, I don't care about Ryan Bates or Connor McGovern. Those guys are fine. This kid has to play and he has to play right away because you're talking about a team that was average ish to below average on the offensive line last year. And they brought in Connor McGovern, who I think is baseline starter, maybe a little better, but you maybe got the best guard in the draft and he absolutely needs to find a place on your offensive line. And the luxury that would give the bills if Ryan Bates finds himself as the swing man on this offense to where he can now back up at left guard, right guard, or to your point, also center for Mitch Morse. Now you're cooking with gas on the offensive line. There is not one interior injury that can tank you. You're not looking at Greg Van Roten coming in off the bench. You're not looking at Greg Mance. It's now you have Ryan Bates coming in. And by the way, David Edwards also sitting there ready to come in. The team's in great shape on the interior line. I'm fascinated to see how quickly they let this guy, Osiris Torrance, get on the field because he is going to instantly upgrade their running game. And I believe the stat I saw was he didn't give up a sack when he was in college. So, and he had, he was in the SEC. So he was going against some of the best interior defensive linemen every single week in the sec and he held up just fine. So I think this pick has a chance to be great. He needs to get on the field right away. He certainly is, should be one of their most talented offensive linemen, but my head is having a hard time wrapping around the scheme fit because now we are two picks in and we've seen them take a tight end. That is probably going to put them in more 12 personnel and a guard that while is good at pass blocking is an absolute road grader in the run game. And now we're two picks in Luca. And I'm wondering, are, are the bills trying to become a power running team before our eyes? <laughs> I, I know, or I understand where you're coming from with that. And maybe there is like a sprinkle of that in there. I don't think it's like a full on overhaul of a change of philosophy, but I will say what I do like about this is They've tried what seems to be the same thing on numerous years now. And it's like they've recognized or at least pinpointed, you hope, certain things that they clearly see as massive deficiencies with how they've done stuff. And, and I'm not talking about like the draft process of evaluating talent necessarily even with that, but just like what they've had on the field and what has worked and what hasn't. And it's like, okay, how can we actually address that and improve that part of our game? And maybe that is, how can we improve our power running game? How can we improve our run game in general to also complement better? And clearly offensive line was not helping that. So let's go and get the best guard in this draft, especially at that run blocking ability and do that. I will say this, you make that comment about, you know, they liked freak athletes at the guard position. And I understand RAS maybe didn't have them listed as an insane high uh, score. But when you look at even certain metrics and stuff like that, where it's like he ran a 53140, which historically is right at the middle point. It's not freakish, but it's not a slouch either. He has incredible wingspan. It's 99 percentile, 83 and 7 eighths inches. Like he has incredible athletic. Uh, tributes and measurables to him that actually make it seem like he might be a little bit more athletic. I mean, he's six foot five, 330 pounds, and he still is 50th percentile with his 40 time. That's to me, that's more impressive than just being middle of the pack, just due to his sheer size. Like that is a massive human being. I think there's a lot to love about him. And I'm with you hundred percent when it comes to the comment about he needs to be playing day one, this guy on paper on, and you are correct, by the way, in his four year starting in the college level, which he wasn't in the SEC that entire time, I don't believe. But overall, he has never allowed a sack in his entire career. That is over 3,000 snaps. He has never once had a sack credited against him. That is just remarkable considering just all the diverse talent and everything you have been across from. And he has been perfectly fine handling his own business and supposedly. Pass blocking is kind of the thing that's lesser in his game compared to the run blocking that all of that in a box as a present to us at pick 59 is like, okay, yes, Bates and McGovern are going to figure out the one side at guard 
And this guy is going to be starting on the other side. This is going to be probably your starting right guard to me. It's like, this is your dude right there. Get him comfortable. Let him grow into that position next to Spencer Brown or whoever it is at right tackle next to him. And it's like, let him figure it out. And the best part about that is if it really starts working out from day one, because he was a potentially a first round pick and everything like that. And maybe Kincaid isn't getting the production you want. It is very easy to forget about that because the biggest kind of sore of this offense, yes, there's been, you know, receiving production. That was a problem, but it was always back to the offensive line, back to the offensive line. And if you can sure up that right side a little bit more, which has been the glaring issue to the point where Josh Allen even looks like he's hearing footsteps because of it, it, it all due to this pick. A lot of these deficiencies or things that you might not like about other picks around it will go away very quickly because this is a massive help to something that we didn't really even think was there until it was finally put in front of us. All right, let's grade the pick. Um, I graded uh, Dalton Kincaid first. I'll let you have the honors of going first here on Osiris Torrance. Ooh, perfect. I love getting this one first because I said it before heavily into this grade is just the fact of BPA because the individuals that were around there at that point that I labeled as possible other players drafted that I would have been very happy with or would have made sense are Drew Sanders. We talked about Jalen Hyatt, of course. And then also uh, just to throw it out there, if they wanted to go offensive line, there's a guy who is technically a tackle in the draft, but really was seen as a guard, although was announced on draft day or night as a tackle as well. Tyler Steen, who inevitably went a few picks later to the Eagles. Um, that actually fit the athletic profile that you even mentioned a little bit more so that they liked in guards. Um, but overall, those were the guys. I don't look at them and say that I would rather have them over tar- Torrance. It, honestly, it, it might not even be that close. I would love to see Jalen Hyatt. I'm, I'm with that like as a player. But just when it comes to value on top of it, like the value of Os- Osiris Torrance is just so much higher there than Jalen Hyatt to me just because of all of a sudden the – growing things that it brought to my mind of what he can do so overall my grade is an a minus i think this pick and everything about it is an a minus pick and honestly the minus could have even not been there but overall it's just a minus only due to the fact that it's like in the back of my head i'm like could we have maybe done something else position need wise to add on top of it yes but the value is just way too good to not take him we're sharing a brain on this one i'm gonna go a minus as well I'm still a little confused about what I think is is a scheme fit, but I'm going to, again, applaud Brandon Bean because we're two picks in. You said it about tight end, not necessarily a need. Guard, we already outlined, not a huge need. Brandon Bean stuck to his board and took the best player on his board. And quite honestly, I don't want a GM who looks at the fact that we may not have the most ideal linebacker situation in 2023 and says, well, I'm going to go draft Drew Sanders, who's here on my board. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see my hand. It's a little lower than the other hand, whereas I have this guard who's just standing out above the rest. What's interesting about how he said this with Osiris Torrance is they had calls to trade back, and they didn't even consider it because of how high he was sticking out on the board. He started. I had had this tweet here from our podcast account. Osiris Torrance started. 34 games at right guard in college and played exclusively on the right side the last three seasons. I would expect he slots right into the right guard. He needs to be on the field. This gray goes down in a hurry if training camp's two or three weeks in and he's still rotating in with Ryan Bates or Connor McGovern or he's getting even less snaps than those guys because they're the incumbent starters or the veterans or the higher paid guys. That's nonsense. Get this player on the field. He's a high prospect. And I will tell you, I will retroactively change this grade in August if it sounds like he is not on track to be a day one starter because he absolutely should be. All right, Luca. In the third round, the Bills make their first defensive selection in this draft, and they select linebacker Dorian Williams out of Tulane. Dorian Williams was a popular guy on mock draft Wednesday for Bill's chat. I think he popped up in almost all of our mock drafts. Interesting player, similar size to Terrell Bernard. I think, how do I want to say this? I think there was way too much. We just drafted Terrell Bernard again on Twitter. And I know this is a sticking point for you. 
So I'm actually just going to shut up. I know you have stuff you want to get off your mind. I don't want to steal any of your thunder. Um, I'll pick up after you're done. Let's talk about Dorian Williams and what kind of fit you think this is. Yeah, I was quickly looking at Twitter. And yes, Josh runs our Twitter account, people. But I do very closely pay attention to everything that's going on in the Twitter world myself and see the mentions, see the comments and everything. I DM Josh about a lot of them all the time and see, laugh about it, whatever it might be going on. Not that I'm laughing at people per se. I'm just saying we, I see it all just as much as he does. What I will say is very quickly was I understanding where it was going. And this is just not even on Twitter. I was seeing it in group chats and stuff. I'm not going to say names or anything like that. It was just like, the amount of negativity towards it where the immediate reaction was, but we just took a Bernard round three last season. And on the surface, I can fully understand why that's the gut reaction, but it can't be the crutch that makes you absolutely despise this pick. Because if that's the only thing you understand about it and you look at it and you go, we can't be doing this. We can't take another undersized linebacker. This is ridiculous. It's a failure in the process. All of these different things that had been thrown out immediately after the pick, I think that's uneducated. I think that's just reckless. I think that's stupid because on the surface, it may appear by that. And I really appreciate what you said to even go into this. It's like the, you know, the similar size, you know, the, the measurables of some capacity were there where you can maybe make that comparison, but that's really where it kind of stops with these guys. Because when you looked at Terrell Bernard at Baylor and you watch that tape and understand who he was as a player, when he was at Baylor, because I'm not talking about anything he did for the bills. I'm talking about what the bills understood they were getting when drafting him. And then you look at Dorian Williams to me, and I'm assuming to the bills as well. They are two completely different style linebackers because when I look at Terrell Bernard, I see what I think they also believe they saw where it came to an athletic coverage style linebacker can be a true athletic off ball. He's not going to be the guy who's trying to nose down the ball all the time and stuff like that and can get lost in the shuffle due to his size limitations. But overall, he's got that quick twitch enough to be a coverage style linebacker, hopefully down the road. And then obviously we saw him on the field and it didn't even seem like that was possible for him possibly due to things between the ears, stuff like that. Just the game speed was not something he was able to adapt to. When you watch Dorian Williams, I see basically a guy in the frame of a smaller size linebacker, but is trying to play like he's six foot five and is just basically nosing down the ball, thumping the carrier, wants to go sideline to sideline or downhill. He is doing everything in his power to get through blocks and everything like that and try to get down to the ball carrier as quick as possible. He is a nose down head hunter at times where it comes to just trying to get to the ball carrier as fast as possible. And then has that smaller elite athleticism to him that he can do that with his long arms as a sure tackler. And that's where, you know, I think also those bean comments, which I'll let you talk about a little bit more may have also fueled the individuals who are being negative about the pick, the initial, comments made by Bean, but overall I loved how he backtracked it and then immediately came out about what he, the mind, the mindset was with him because that's where I was. Every time we mocked him, Josh, I genuinely believed him to be potentially a nice long-term fit for the builds because he's a sure tackler, which we all know they love in both DBs and linebacker linebackers. And on top of it, he just loves to go sideline to sideline and has the athleticism to do so. He's a little shorter and stuff like that, but you can beef up a little bit when it comes to your actual weight and stuff like that. And he wants to get at it. He wants to get to the ball and you could eventually develop into potentially a small mic or whatever it is. They have done it with other guys in their past when it comes to McDermott, like, when Keekley was gone and you'd watch the Panthers back in that era, Thomas Davis, not the biggest of individuals, but I don't think anyone was out there questioning him as their Mike linebacker. When he would do that, he would, he would be listed as a left or right side linebacker, depending on the season. But he, there would be times that he would be lined up out there at the Mike position and he did perfectly okay doing so. So I'm not overly concerned about it. And I thought it was a little ridiculous for the amount of negativity that this pick is going. I can get that. You might've wanted something else there. There are players out there that I agreed were there like a Siaki Ika that I even had on my kind of, I like this guy a little bit. I think he could be a nice fit on the interior defensive line, but overall to just slander this guy because of seeing the failure that looks like Bernard is just stupid to me. So Brandon Bean in his post draft press conference said one of his things that he wished he had come out of this draft with was a defensive tackle, but the value never lined up. 
And I'm with you. Si- Siaki Ika was one of those players where in the third round, you're thinking, oh, this this lines up with what they need. So that tells you the Bills just didn't value him as much as Doreen Williams. Prior to the Williams pick, the, the linebacker situation got a little depressing. The Bills had the 28th pick in the third round at pick 22 and 23, Henley and then Trenton Simpson went off the board. And then at pick 27, Overshone went to the Cowboys. So just unfortunate. The Bills were not in position to trade up to get those guys. I think, you know, after trading up in round one to get Kincaid, Bean was certainly not going to be aggressive again. And that's the right move. You don't want to do multiple trade ups, trade ups if you can avoid it. So I, I'm not faulting him for that. I'll tell you, I posted a meme to our account that got a lot of traction. The three headed dragon where the two dragons look fierce and angry. And then the third one just looks super confused. And I put round one, round two, round three with round three being under the confused dragon and people, you know, it it got a lot of traction. People loved it. That hated the Dory Williams pick. People were like, why do you hate this kid? And I posted that because I had just listened to the Brandon Bean press conference on Friday night after wrapping up day two. And I went to bed hating the pick. I've always liked Dorian Williams, the prospect. What I hated were the words that came out of Brandon Bean's mouth after day two, when he said he's a guy that's going to compete at Matt Milano's spot. Okay. So he's uh, capped as a backup and he's somebody that's going to cover kicks for us. And while I can respect the fact that a third round pick on a Super Bowl contender in a weak draft, all of those things I think are very true. We saw kickers going off the board in round three and round four. If you want to know how shallow this draft class was, I can respect the fact that your third round pick might be covering kicks. What I was confused as hell about is the Bills with their current linebacker depth chart drafted a linebacker on day three and right after that in the press conference they are resigned to the fact that he's a backup and he's covering kicks that angered me beyond belief why can't he compete well the next day rounds four through seven go by brandon bean gives his wrap-up press conference the great beat reporters followed up on that and brandon bean said you know i he, he's going to get a chance to compete at both spots. And what I love about this is he said, Dorian Williams is already asking to learn both spots. And then Brandon Bean did clarify. He said, look, the Mike has a lot of responsibilities. We don't want to put too much on his shoulders. They're calling plays out there, but Dorian Williams is pushing for that opportunity. So I feel a lot better sitting here today because it sounded to me after Friday that the bills had pretty much been closed off to the fact that he would be anything but a Matt Milano backup. And that to me is not good resource usage in the third round. And, and after listening to the wrap up press conference, I feel a lot better about the fact that he's at least going to get a chance to compete for that spot. One other thought I have Luca about the linebacker situation, replacing Tremaine Edmonds, the bills have been incredibly spoiled since they had that Edmonds Milano pairing of having two three down linebackers that never come off the field. And I think there's a chance that we've been viewing this. How do we replace Tremaine Edmonds a little bit wrong? I don't necessarily think it has to be one player that replaces Tremaine Edmonds. When you look around the league, these three down linebackers don't necessarily exist at every position on every team. Matt Milano is still a three down linebacker. I could absolutely see a situation where early downs, you have Tyrell Dodson, AJ Klein, more run situations where you expect them to have to take on the blockers out there. Bale Inspector, you get into the passing situations. That could be a situation where you see a Dorian Williams or even a Taylor Rapp come out there and be like a dime backer. I think this is going to be a strength in numbers situation, and it's not going to be a, hey, Terrell Bernard, go out there and be Tremaine Edmonds. It's going to be, hey, Terrell Bernard, go out there and be 20% of Tremaine Edmonds on these downs. And then, hey, Bale Inspector, go out there and be 20% of Tremaine Edmonds on these downs. And then, hey, when it's a passing situation, Taylor Rapp, Dorian Williams, whoever, whoever you like in those roles. I started thinking about this, Luca, and I, I'm starting to really wonder, maybe the Bills don't anticipate just one player taking over that role. Yeah, so... I, I haven't had that as my full thought process on this, 
But when you didn't see the free agents come in, such as, you know, Levante David or any of these guys that really felt like they would fit that spot and everything like that, and they just let the market be what it was and then went into this draft where you had your Jack Campbell, which everything happened with Jack Campbell that it did. And then it was just a bunch of other guys that really fit a different mold like Dorian Williams also fits. It just, to me, started being trickling in my head, this thought that you are sharing right here. I'm I'm so happy, honestly, you brought this up because I, I feel like it's something that maybe individuals need to do. And then when I even look at it, like, look at the Kansas City Chiefs, for instance. And I bring up the Chiefs because their linebackers, they so they only have two standing linebackers that they list, and it's Willie Gay and Nick Bolton. Nick Bolton is their every down guy. But even Willie Gay comes off the field. They'll bring in Leo Chanel. They just signed Drew Tranquil, I'm pretty sure, to rotate in. They don't just sign Drew Tranquil, a young kind of in his prime linebacker, to just sit on the bench. He is a startable, worthy linebacker. They rotate guys in and out of that position based on what they're trying to accomplish on defense. And I, I do wonder that. I wonder if McDermott is kind of pulling from that thought process. And it's, and it's like, hey, Milano is our first team all pro linebacker. He is our guy, our, our stable bedrock at the linebacker position. And then we have all these other guys that fit different molds and needs that maybe we do bring them in based on what we're seeing and what we're trying to accomplish on defense. And then, yeah. Maybe he even goes as far as bringing in Taylor Rapp to be, you know, like a slimebacker, like that undersized little kind of DB linebacker position on top of it, or even brings Taron Johnson inside even more so to do that and do whatever else. I think replacing uh, Edmonds doesn't have to be as simple as just finding another guy to replace him. You need, it's kind of the, um, Kind of cross sports here a little bit. You know, I'm, I was hesitating a bit. It's the money ball thought process. You need to replace this many runs and this at bat and this basis, right? You need to replace all these things to replace the production. You don't have to do it by signing one individual to change that or to get that production. You can do it by achieving it with all these smaller parts collectively. You can get that production back. And maybe that's where their heads are at. And I don't necessarily disagree with that kind of philosophy because you see it work successfully with something like the Chiefs where you have your Nick Bolton, who is a beast, but then they have these other guys like Willie Gay, Leo Chanel, and now Drew Tranquil in there to kind of rotate in and out based on whatever they're trying to do on defense. It makes a lot of sense to me, to be quite honest. All right, let's give it a grade. Um, I, I'll go first on this one. I'm going to give this one a B minus. And I like the player a lot. And the other thing that weighs into this is there's not anything that was available to the bills at that spot that I was just pounding the table. Oh, you got to do this instead. Um, had a couple of those linebackers I already mentioned fall into the bills like Trenton Simpson. And then they went with Dorian Williams. I'd, I'd be in a little bit different headspace right now. Um, but I was not the biggest Dewan Jones fan. Um, I, I like Jordan battle, but Luke has been saying all along that this safety class is so weak that why even dip your toe into it? Just, just go next year where there's so many good safety sitting there. No need to do that. I do like the defensive tackle. The Colts took at the top of round four, and I'm going to butcher his name. Northwestern at freakish athlete. I thought he was somebody to maybe take a chance on, but if Dorian Williams is a top player on their board, I respect it. As long as he gets a chance to compete this year, that's all I want is a chance. I'm not saying he has to even win the job or that I'd predict he wins the job, but I want to see Joe Biscalia. I keep bringing him up. Matt Perino, whoever's covering camp, talk about how there were at least a couple reps in practice where you saw Dorian Williams play the mic, and then I will be satisfied, and I'll be like, he got a shot. And if it ends up being Tyrell Dodson or Balen Specter or Terrell Bernard, then I will at least know that they didn't just put in ink that this kid is a backup year one. I have some belief that they're not going to do that. So that's why I'm going to give it a B minus. If I sat here today, if I would have graded this on Friday when I thought he was in stone as a backup, it would have been a C minus or a D plus quite candidly as is. I like the player. There was nobody else around that pick that I was like, Oh, you got to get this guy. And um, they had a need at linebacker. Like, so I, I, it all adds up. So um, I love I love that. I think B minus is pretty fair. 
Um, I'll get to my grade in a second. I do love the player you brought up because the one player I wrote down other than Siaki Ika that we already mentioned was Adetomoia Adeboore. Shout out. Uh, you. you were ready for that one. I was I was studying his name all weekend because I was actually getting I was getting the vibe that we were actually going to be drafting him at some mm. point. So I was like getting ready. I practiced a little bit. And then the lady who was announcing it on the draft, I made sure I listened when I saw the spoiler first. I was like, OK, I got to see how it's actually pronunciated. So anyways, those were the only two guys, though, that I really highlighted. And then, yes, as you pointed out, as we were going through all of this, they clearly did not view Ika high on their boards. And I would guess they probably had questions. Yes, he's athletic and everything like that, but maybe they just didn't trust him enough to bring him in on the rotation, especially for a third round pick. So they just didn't view it that way. Overall, the thing I actually kind of liked about this pick the most, Josh, was yes, linebacker is somewhat of a need and probably looked at as one of the more bigger needs on this team. And that production left there, that is a whole of Edmonds's production from last season. But overall, to me, this is also a bit of an acceptance that that Bernard pick probably wasn't a good one. And you need to accept that sooner rather than later. You're not trying to dig yourself deeper because of that pick and you want to see how it works out. It's like immediately you have this other guy sitting here and it's like, OK, we might have to accept failure on this. Let's go get another guy who can hopefully actually do things that we need him to do in that role. And then on top of it, he's excited to maybe potentially become that maybe small mic or whatever he can develop into so i gave it a very solid flat b i i liked the pick i liked the player i liked the mindset the only reason i gave it a b and not a b plus or anything like that was just simply because i have a little bit of a preference when it was like at that point in time there were guys in my opinion that were defensive linemen that i was like you know they're probably going to get more production out of them immediately because they like to rotate their D-line more, and I just think this is not necessarily a pick that I view as an immediate return as much as I want it to be. And overall, based on comments and things like that, it's where I'm like, oh, I would like something that's a little bit more immediate return, especially from what we saw from that Bernard pick and the lack of immediate returns last season. So it's just, to me, an overall B, but it could move kind of like what you said with Osiris Torrance. If in camp they're loving him and everything like that, and he becomes a legitimate like regular player and rotational when it comes to linebacker, or maybe even just flat out impresses the hell out of him and becomes the regular, I could easily move this to an A really quick. We are three picks in. We have three players with paths to playing time that are very realistic, and that's that's a good thing. So we'll see what happens with Dorian Williams, where they slot him. As long as they give him a shot, I'll keep it in the B range. If not, if it again, Thursday night, it would have been a D plus. But let's go a little bit quicker here through the day three picks. We're about an hour in. You know, We wanted to hit the meat of the draft, but we do want to talk about these guys they got on, on day three. So I'll just kind of give a quick overview, and we'll get into our grades. In the fifth round, I'm not going to say his name wrong this time. I know his name is just is um, Justin Shorter. I said Justin Florida for some reason, but his name is hilarious because for a guy named Shorter, he's the tallest wide receiver in the room. They get Justin Shorter from Florida. Luca, I really liked the process that led to getting Justin Shorter. The Bills moved down and recoup picks. They got back the pick, not the exact pick, but they got back the quantity of picks that they started this draft, having spent two to get up and get Dalton Kincaid in the first round. I love that. The other thing I will tell you, Brandon Bean loves, loves seventh round picks. I said this on a, twi a Twitter spaces with uh, Uber Hansen on cover one on Saturday before the draft even kicked off. Look for Brandon Bean to trade down today. He loves seventh round picks. And the reason why undrafted free agents don't want to come to the bills because it is a hard roster to make. And these agents are looking at these rosters and they're like, I want to get you to a spot where you have a shot to make this roster. And teams like the Bills, teams like the Chiefs, teams like the Eagles, teams like the Bengals, they get left out in the cold a lot with these undrafted free agents. So the trick is get a lot of picks in the seventh round. And that's where you start taking guys that you have priority free agent grades on. And we saw that play out here on day three with the Bills. I love the process that led to them trading down and getting him. I also really love his skill set. He adds size to the room. He's a good deep threat. He he was a top-notch high school recruit. In fact, he was a higher high school rated recruit than Jamar Chase and Jalen Waddell and um, St. Brown from the Lions. Obviously, it didn't pan out that way in college, but he has good deep speed. 
He still has some issues with his route running. My favorite thing about this pick, though, Luca, he comes into the league with four phase special team experience. And Brandon Bean called that out in his press conference. And what does that mean? It means there is zero risk of this kid getting Isaiah Hodgins while he's developing because he's going to be on the 53. He can be a core special team player while he learns how to be an NFL receiver. There's no need to put him on the practice squad. He's going to contribute from day one so you can grow him the next couple of years without any risk of the Giants coming in or the Eagles coming in and grabbing him off your practice squad. And I love that because the Bills are in a tough spot where a lot of their day three picks do get put on the practice squad. And then you see guys like Jack Anderson and Rashad Wild Goose get plucked before we ever get a chance to figure out what those guys have. We lost Isaiah Hodgins. So all of that with this ball of clay that was one time a top-notch high school recruit in Justin Shorter going into the mix and getting one of the few prospects in this draft, this short, small slot wide receiver draft that actually has the body type and the physicality to one day potentially be an X in the NFL. I, I was thrilled with this. He was a top 30 visitor. So we knew the bills were sniffing around him. I thought this was a really strong pick. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't have too much more to add to that. I think First and foremost, very impressive on your research. I don't know if you did it yourself, but to understand where his recruiting rank was, I was aware of it, but I wasn't necessarily sure because I know you are not as big into college and everything like that. That was the whole thing. I was like, I the only reason I knew his name was because he was an eight overall national ranked uh, guy, the number one wide receiver, as you mentioned, and everything of his, uh, uh, what you call it? Uh, why am I blanking out? Recruit class. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I said thank you to no one. Um, <laughs> thank you, myself. Yeah, thank you, myself. I'm, I'm <laughs> just getting late here. Um, but yeah, overall, it's like there's the high end, you know, process or prospect that is what he is. And then there's other things like he's 229 pounds. So that's a big boy. He's six foot four and he's got a wingspan that's 82 and three eighth inches. I'm pretty sure he was ranked as high as he was, because if you looked at him just as a body, you're mm -hmm. like, holy crap, this guy is just lengthy and huge. Like he is just a big, big SOB. So, yeah. And he still ran a four five five for being as big and heavy as that, like at wide receiver. That's a pretty uh, impressive in my mind, 40 time. Um, and then he's got a broad jump. That's incredible too. But overall, like the athleticism of him is really nice. So then, yeah, if you can just ease him in on the 53, get him playing meaningful special teams reps and also bring him in if you need to and stuff. This is where tipping plays might occur, but they were doing it with Kumaro anyways, when it comes to just bringing him as a run blocker, which he seems to be very good at. Apparently it's like, I, I actually like the pick a lot because there's a lot of upside there potentially. And then also on top of it, there's no pressure for him to have to do anything. So on top of it, he could just live in the depths of the roster and just develop on his own pace and hopefully develop into something meaningful, which clearly seems like there is potential there. So I like a lot about this pick, especially for being a fifth round grade. I can't believe I'm saying, or a fifth round pick. I can't believe I'm saying this that much about a guy that deep into the draft. And he has his warts, but it's funny because through this draft process, we talked a lot about Quentin Johnston as one of the few big receivers in this class. And we kept saying, I wish he played bigger. I wish he was better at the contested, contested catches. Justin Shorter is a beast on contested catches. I just, I, everything about it makes perfect sense. It's exactly what I want in a day three pick. We already know where he's going to contribute year one. He is going to be a core special teamer. He's probably going to be the gunner that runs opposite Saran Neal in that spot vacated by Taiwan Jones. And the bills are going to be in great shape there and they can just continue to develop him. One other thing I learned, Adam Henry, their wide receiver coach was coaching in college at the time and spent a lot of time with Justin shorter on the recruiting trail. And that relationship I think is one reason why the bills went out there and pursued him so much and put a top 30 visit on a kid with a day three draft grade. I think the Bills are empowering their position coaches to have a larger voice in the room. I do want to have a conversation when we're done here about the process, what how I saw it play out. Let's get to grades. I'll knock mine out really quick. This is a solid B for me. The only reason I'm not going to give it an A is because, you know, it's it's day three. What what would an A be in day three outside of somebody that was a first round, second round prospect falling to you? I think we just need to have perspective. I see what his role is going to be. I see his upside as a potential developmental player. 
I think the Bills did great for that spot. The value makes sense when you look at the different draft guides. Um, everything about it is strong. I love the process of trading down to get him. I heard his press conference. He is not short. Uh, short. He is not short on confidence, which I love. And it wasn't cocky, but you can tell he believes in himself and he's got a chip on his shoulder about where he went in this process and kind of being viewed as, you know, basically a college bust, a guy that, you know, was a top recruit and then ended up being a fifth round pick, which fifth round pick in the NFL. You're still like the 1% of the 1% of athletes in this world, but I think it's a good chip on his shoulder. And um, I'm, I'm excited to see where this goes. I think I'm a little bit more critical than you, and I'm not going to go like too long winded with this, hopefully, but I'm a little bit more critical than you on the grade overall. Um, I just want to, again, B minus is what you gave it or B it's just B B. OK, um, yeah, definitely a little bit more critical than you, because I do think there is something there when it comes to you're a top recruit. You're supposed to have all this potential. And yet you look at your production as a five year you know, senior and everything like that. And he never eclipsed. If I'm looking at this correctly, 600 receiving yards in his entire career within a season. And so it never seemed like it worked out too, too much. And there has to be something there to me, but I don't think that's the end of his career and he's going to be a bust because of that alone. I think the potential still there. It's very Josh knows. And I know anyone else that lives. I love potential. I love athleticism. I love it. Like, just because it didn't work here at a doesn't mean it can't work here at B. It just needs to be the right env environment. And you need the right mind and individual talking to that mind to get it and on uncrack the code there so but because of kind of those things when it comes to why didn't it work out and there was five years of evidence of it not working out as much as you would think it would for a top recruit such as himself um overall i gave him a c plus the plus is there for the potential um and stuff like that but really when you're falling to the fifth round and you were supposed to be a lot better in your career and stuff like that and then even like he does have a lot of great measurables and whatnot but like his cone drills and stuff like that are like his three cone drills is 7.35, which is in the three percentile of history. That is very low. So that's like you have enough concerns for me, too, where it's like maybe the athleticism, even though you have that size, isn't quite there. We'll, we'll have to see how it goes, but I, I'll give it a solid C plus. I think there's exciting potential. I share kind of some of the excitement you have, but I think there's a little bit more rough around the edges with him that I'm, I'm a little more cautious. I think at the very least, maybe you get your next Saran Neal where you take him on day three and he becomes a special teamer for the duration of his entire first contract. And then you kind of see where it goes. But the upside's there. I'm excited about it. We'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, and I think, you know, the high end here is you have your Gabe Davis replacement in, in a year or two. Uh, in the seventh round, the Bills, after trading down a couple more times, picked offensive lineman out of Ole Miss, Nick Broker. And interesting pick here, another guard. This is a guy that's played tackle or guard in college, but his frame, his size leads you to think he's much more of a guard in the NFL um, team captain, more of a technician than actually physicality goes um, solid all around pick. I, I, my thing here is I don't know what the path is for him to make the roster. We just talked about it with Osiris Torrance, how loaded they already seem to be at guard. When you talk about Torrance and Bates, and Edwards, and McGovern, and now you throw Nick Broker in there and whatever's going on with Ike Botker. So my one pause here is, did you set him up to fail, essentially, by taking somebody who really, outside of just coming into training camp and setting the world on fire, is going to be on your practice squad and then at risk of being lost? It doesn't have to be a bad thing. It's a seventh round pick. Not all seventh round picks get plucked off practice squads, but I'm having a hard time visualizing the path. Injuries do happen. It's a real thing. Um, Brandon Bean did say, again, it's amazing how often this happens. He was the best player on their board. Dane Brugler had a fifth round grade on him. So that's, you know, in the seventh round, that's a pretty strong value. So um, I'm not even going to like let you talk about him and then I'll just give my grade real quick and kick it to you. I'm going to give this one a B minus. There's not much to dislike about it. The value seems right. Um, they're feeding the trenches again. Um, I, you know, if they, if my one gripe here, I think I would have liked to see the bills maybe take a shot on a running back because right now they only have three under contract, although they did add Jordan Mims and undrafted free agency, but we're talking about the seventh round. Like how, there's, there's nothing they could have done in the seventh round outside of drafting a kicker 
that would have just annoyed me because it's like, oh, this guy's not beating out Tyler Bass. So it makes sense. It's a solid pick. It seems like good value. And um, he has an uphill climb to make the roster, but what seventh round pick doesn't? You are the glaring light to this pick that I am not. I don't understand it. I just flat out don't. I Seventh round to me is lesser BPA than at that point. And, and look, maybe it is and stuff like that. But we we talked about Torrance and everything it does. You brought up that point. Where is the path to playing, if at all? And I'm like, I don't see him being better than five interior offensive linemen, six interior offensive linemen already on this roster. You have this seventh round pick. The pick right after it is a guy I actually do know because he went to Arizona State. It's uh, Nesta Jade Silvera. He's a great, just simple, run-stuffing defensive tackle where it's like I could easily see a playing like path to playing for him way more so than Nick Broker. And again, I don't know how they ranked these guys. I'm just saying, like, I just it to me it just feels like a throwaway pick. You're bringing this guy to see how it is. Maybe you strike gold. But like I'm from the outside looking in, I just don't see how he makes the roster. He's going to be end up on the practice squad, I would imagine, unless he gets picked up somehow by, you know, the Colts like last year where our one offensive lineman late round just got picked up. Was it Luke Tenuta or whatever? Luke Tenuta. Uh, <laughs> I'll never forget the name. for. We him. were not sad to see him go, by the way. <laughs> no, not at all. Took but, one look at him like, whoa. <laughs> but overall, it's just like I, I just don't understand it. Stuff like that. The running back comment you made too, Lou Nichols, the third from Central Michigan. You brought up uh, the backup from Texas that I cannot think the name. Roshan Johnson. Roshan Johnson, and you were like, I like him because he's a bigger back. He's going to add kind mm -hmm. of stuff. He's a little bit more patient runner. You want a poor man's version of that? Hello, Lou Nichols the third from Central Michigan. That's literally what he is. He's a bigger, patient runner who's in there for like tight goal line situations and stuff. He was on the board at that time. It's weird to be critical about a seventh round pick, but when I am looking at one thing when it comes to how is this guy going to make the roster, and I really don't understand how that's going to happen as long as Osiris Torrance is in a complete bus and our depth is what I expect it to be. And then on top of it, there are other things that I think maybe could have had more value of making and cracking the 53. I flat out just don't agree with the pick. I don't care what the value is at that point because a seventh round pick, I would like to be thinking more of how can this guy make the roster, let it, you know, and not being like, well, the value is too good, even though he probably still doesn't have a path to the roster. I just don't get that. So because you have him on control, you have him on wage control. So all that said, everything like that, I give it a D <laughs> like, okay. I am just not a fan of the pick. I'm going to change my pick to a C plus. Cause I just happened to look at my notes and I had forgotten that a couple picks later, five, six picks later, the Colts took Jake Witt, offensive tackle from Northern Michigan University. And to me, Jake Witt was like the perfect guy to take in the seventh round. A one-year starter at tackle, um, had been a tight end his entire college career, and he played well, but he's just super raw, but super athletic. The Bills have struck gold at tackle in their history by taking a college tight end once upon a time in Jason Peters and teaching him how to play tackle on the fly. I think given the fact that Tommy Doyle's coming off of an ACL injury, David Questenberry kind of is what he is at this point. You don't know what's going on with Spencer Brown. I would have rather seen the Bills roll the dice on a Jake Witt or a tackle like that versus a guard that we've already kind of established is really bound for the practice squad, you know, if, if he even is high enough there. And it sounds like value wise, it made sense. But again, like what's the, what's the path to making the team? I think that needs to take precedent over like what your board is saying in the seventh round with the last pick of the draft, Luca, the bills take a defensive back, Alex Austin out of Oregon state. Um, Alex Austin is not going to impress you much with combine results or pro day results. But he is a zone corner. He is not a good tackler. He did not play any special teams in college. So um, when you want to talk about a guy whose path to making the team gets tricky, I, I don't know. That, Alex Austin's not going to beat out Trey White or Kyir Elam for the starting role. He's not going to beat out Taron Johnson. So you want him to play special teams, and he's never done it, and he's a bad tackler. I, um, I don't, I don't mind the bills taking a shot on a defensive back. They got Dane Jackson in the seventh round. He's been an adequate starter for them. They found Levi Wallace in the undrafted free agency. He was a solid starter for them. And for the most part, I will just defer to Sean McDermott's eyes and Brandon beans eyes when it comes to late defensive backs. 
They proved it. I don't think you and I, you or I were over the moon with Christian Benford the day after the draft. We took one look at him once training camp and preseason was rolling around and we were like, okay, I get it. And he, and this, um, this, uh, Alex Austin has a little bit of that. You even made the comment that maybe they view him as more of kind of a tweener, maybe like a Cam Lewis that can go between nickel and boundary and safety. Uh, we'll see. Seventh round pick again. You don't want to sit there and put all your eggs in the basket of him being successful. I'm going to give it a flat C. It's average. I have no criticism about anything else that was on the board. And I I see no real path to him making this roster when you start looking at the numbers. But at the same time, corner is one of those positions that you can get injuries piling up kind of quickly. And so I don't mind the Bills just taking a stab on a corner they like. And, you know, if Dane Jackson tears his ACL in training camp, you might be really happy you took this kid. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, I don't I don't even have to give a lot to it. I think what you said there was great. I gave it a flat C as well because simply Christian Benford, you said it mm -hmm. spot on. It's like I am not going to ever evaluate a corner, especially on day three of a draft and be like, I think I know more than McDermott. And the case is Christian Benford. It's like, clearly there's something that they understand more. So that's why they are who they are. And I am who I am. So I will take their word on it, but I just have no opinion on it as beyond that. Like you said, off air, I did mention, I was like, this kind of feels more like they're really trying to see if they can develop in an, him into a tweener or even just a safety at that point. And they just want to see what they have because there's clearly something they like about him. And because of that, it's like, okay, I'll give it a flat C because I just have nothing on top of that. I don't know much about him, anything like that. He doesn't pop off to me about anything. And just overall, I just think it's a C because we'll see where it goes. I think his path to making the roster would really be beating out Cam Cam Lewis. And that I think Bill's fans, their frustration with Jake Kumaro and Taiwan Jones, Cam Lewis is about to be the new version of that because two of your lasting memories of Cam Lewis from last year were getting dunked on by Justin Jefferson because he didn't knock the ball down on fourth down and then running into the punter against Miami that almost cost the Bills the game in December. But what Cam Lewis did last year was become one of the best four phase special teamers on this team. He has, he has experience at boundary experience at nickel cross trained at safety. He made himself a very, very valuable backup player on this team. And I, I just don't see a situation where Alex Austin comes in and unseats him. A couple names to mention that the bills did sign an undrafted free agency. One name that I'm actually somewhat excited about DJ Dale defensive lineman from Alabama. Um, he was a player that Dane Brugler had in the fifth round, and he is much more of a one technique. And I do think we saw what happened when Daquan Jones went down in the playoff game. Tim Settle is not equipped to be the backup one technique. Um, we know that's not Jordan Phillips game. So I do think there is a path on this roster for DJ Dale or somebody to come in and be that backup one technique. But before I get into that, um, Jordan Mims running back from Fresno state cool stat there. Like he has not fumbled the ball since 2017. <laughs> That's wild ball security is great. There's obviously a room for one running back here. It might be him, but we also know the bills were talking to Latavius Murray prior to the draft. Something could happen there. Um, outside of that, you know, we're not going to get too much into these undrafted free agents. They all sound great at the time, but those were the two that really popped off DJ Dale and Jordan Mims. But what I do want to talk about, Brandon Bean said, the compensatory formula, they're expecting it to get a third round pick for losing Tremaine Edmonds. And the, the formula basically works is when you sign somebody, it works as a net gain. And when you lose somebody, it's a net loss. If your net loss is more than your net gain, you're able to get a pick. So that's why the bills have been really modest in their signings. The formula deadline is this coming week. So the bills can start being more active in free agency this coming week. And Brandon Bean even said he anticipates them signing a defensive lineman or maybe two. And I think you could see them go out and sign a running back like Latavius Murray, a defensive lineman like Puna Ford from Seattle, who we know they've had an interest in. Luke and I have heard that they kicked the tires on um, Frank Clark earlier in free agency. He's still sitting out there. Justin Houston sitting out there. There's moves out there to be made. I'm still pounding the table for George Fant. I actually pounded my table. Because I just I don't want to be in a situation where this team with this roster could be relying on David Questenberry at left tackle if something happens to Deion Dawkins and George Fant is just sticking out to me as somebody who would be a great swing tackle. Look for the Bills to be somewhat aggressive there. 
Uh, Luca, before I get into a couple of big picture questions, before we get out of here, any thoughts on what I just said about undrafted free agents or Brandon Bean's comments about veterans? Um, no, I'm just surprised you didn't bring up Jalen Wayne just to get your normal plug in and stuff like that about <laughs> yeah. the 2000s Colts. But overall, no, I mean, I, I do like your point about DJ Dale. There, There is something there that makes it a little bit more intriguing. And then just Jordan Mims fact, like everything about him is just hilarious when it comes to his stats and facts and stuff. Mm -hmm. Hilarious in all the best ways, like nothing funny in a bad way. But yeah, I'm just shocked you didn't do your Jalen Wayne plug there and just mention that he's the cousin of uh nfl future hall of, is he already a hall of famer i can't remember anyway no he's he not he keeps getting snubbed yeah i feel like he's eventually gonna break through but reggie wayne and stuff like that just to add to your colts comparisons and stuff like that so we, we got dallas clark in the first round and dalton kincaid we were the originators of the dallas clark comp by yeah. the way i just want to throw that out there because i've seen that going around on twitter i need you guys to know where you heard that first um, <laughs> and then we got reggie wayne's cousin which Cousin kind of surprised me. I thought maybe it might be nephew. And I was like, there's an age gap there, but deep man, family, deep family. <laughs> Reggie Wayne was one of those players, man, that just, I loved, I loved Reggie Wayne. Anyway, nobody cares about my love affair for Reggie Wayne. All right, Luke, a couple questions for you before we get out of here. One, we talked about the fact that the bills under Brandon Bean had had a checklist of what they looked for in first round prospects, 21 or younger top 30 visit, uh, physical traits, we saw them go against that with Dalton Kincaid with the top 30 visit and the 21 and under with his age. And then in the second round, we saw them go against that with Osiris Torrance also with the 21 and under. And the other thing I will tell you is Kyer Elam, I'm still high on, felt very much like a, we need a cornerback. He's the best cornerback available. We're going to take Kyer Elam. This draft, it felt like the Bills almost erased their board as far as needs go. And they just stuck to their board and picked the best player available. So when you look at the fact that one, they got away from their trend, their checklist that had been a truth for them and their, their five first round picks under Brandon Bean. And then you saw some divergence from some of their need picks to, Hey, like we Gregory Rousseau, we need to find a way to get Patrick Mahomes to the ground. And then coincidentally, Gregory Rousseau and Boogie Basham were the two highest rated players on their board when they picked. Were they, or did you just need defensive ends? I think that the Bills are well aware that their drafts the last couple of years have been kind of underwhelming. And they're seeing teams like the Chiefs go to the Super Bowl in large part because of the success of their rookie contributors. And I think that the Bills scouted their process scouted their tendencies and i think it showed in this draft that changes were made and as a fan of this team that really excites me self-scouting it needs to happen no matter the business no matter what you do you need to self-evaluate and self-scout you need to see there is always room to grow there's always ways to improve at anything you do if you think you are good enough, I feel like I'm giving an inspirational speech right now. If you think you are good enough at something, you aren't figure out how to get better at it, stuff like that. And that's what I do believe I'm sharing a thought with you when it comes to this. They finally looked themselves in the mirror and they were drafting based on both best player available for immediate needs. And now it's like, OK, how can we just get the best player on our board, regardless of what it seems like our biggest glaring needs are? And then they came to this conclusion as the board was breaking down the way it was, especially with Dalton Kincaid. They didn't bring him in for this visit and stuff. They understood who he was according to their grade. And it's just like, oh, my God, this guy's falling to us. We need to move up and make sure we get him because we had him above all of these other ones that are going to be available. And I would imagine if he wasn't there, they were trading back because I believe they made that comment even so that they would have probably done so. So. It wasn't like I mentioned when we talked about it, it wasn't like a glaring need. It almost felt like a luxury ish kind of pick, but it's like they loved him. He was at the top of their guy at their board at the time. And it's like, we just need to go get our guy who's at the top of our board, regardless of the hole at linebacker or maybe even helping out the tackle position or whatever else you want to paint there, wide receiver, so on and so forth. It's like, just go get that. And then they doubled down on that and went and got an interior offensive lineman who also didn't really check those boxes, but because he was so good of value and everything like that, they were just like, we need to just get this guy. We need to take him and move on with our day. And I love that. I, I 
absolutely am in love with that kind of change of philosophy because I, it's hard for fans to see and it's hard for them to win them over on stuff at times. But, you know, we're a family show here, so I'm not going to say what it, but, you know, bleep those fans, do what you need to do and take the best player available. That's always what you have to do. You have to just take best players available. And because of that alone, like I'll get to my overall grade if we're even going to do that. We'll get like, there. Yep. Yeah. And it's like I bumped my overall grade, uh, you know, a touch just because that's what I genuinely believe this. I mean, the Dorian Williams pick and accepting that you effed up on the third round pick of last year already, potentially you need to get ahead of it is why you get that bump in the third round pick. Osiris Torrance and Kincaid are clear value picks at that point in time. And then to even recognize that Kincaid was not going to make it to you because of those Dallas Cowboys. And it was reported clear as day that you pissed them off by doing so. To me, all of that, I love it. Self-scouting, big thing. I'm with you 100%. I do believe they did do that. They changed their draft process and how they evaluate everything and what they need to do on draft day and came to this conclusion and did it very, very well. What grade do you give the Buffalo Bills? Maybe Brandon Bean specifically, but Sean McDermott also. What grade do you give the Bills for their 2023 draft class? My grade overall is a B plus. It's not quite an A draft, but I would have said it's basically a B draft where I love the mindset change and I love everything about that. So I bumped it up to a plus because overall I love the value and everything of Osiris Torrance. I think it's great. It wasn't what seemed to be an immediate need, but it just looks better and better by the days moving on. And then Dalton Kincaid, I said it before. It's like, I want to see that they understand what they just drafted and what they could potentially do with it because it's all potential. And we haven't seen anything that backs that up yet. But I would like to believe that maybe this is the start of that when it comes to they are self-scouting. They are doing a better job trying to do their jobs better and then are moving forward. So so I gave it a good solid B plus. Also, that Nick Broker pick dropped it down. I mean, a D <laughs> can't have a D on a report card there. So B plus. <laughs> Poor Nick Broker. <laughs> um, I'm going to give this this draft, this whole draft process an A minus and one, it, it's not a situation where it's like, okay, you got an A minus, A minus, C. Like, they're not weighted equally. Dalton Kincaid and Osiris Torrance count more on the grade scale than Nick Broker and Alex Austin. It's just the reality of the NFL draft, the more expensive assets. I was very impressed with Brandon Bean, the process. Uh, we talked about how it seems like they they stopped some of their truths of we're always going to draft players in the first round that are 21 or younger, or they had to be on a top 30 visit. It seems like they made some changes to their process, which I think is important. The other thing I will tell you, for the first time in Brandon Bean's tenure, since his first season here when he was just trading every player on the roster left over from Doug Whaley, he prioritized stocking up on future picks. And the Bills right now have 10 picks in the 2024 draft, assuming they get that third round compensatory pick for losing Tremaine Edmonds. And I also want to bubble that in here is Brandon Bean this offseason has shown a great awareness and great patience with the compensatory formula, allowing himself to get that pick. The Bills have they they haven't been this stocked up with picks since the 18 draft. When they traded Ronald Darby, they traded Sammy Watkins, they traded Cordy Glenn, they traded Tyrod Taylor, and they just had pick after pick after pick. And it was Brandon Bean making over this roster. And now they go into the 2024 draft with 10 picks. And then you look at this class, they got what they obviously consider is the best tight end in this class, one of the best offensive receivers in this class in Dalton Kincaid. They got arguably the best offensive guard in this class in Osiris Torrance. Both of those guys have a clear path to being starters or instant contributors. Dalton Kincaid might be tricky as a starter because are they going to announce a second tight end as a starter? But I think he's going to have a very large role. And then down the line, the rest of the picks just make sense to me. Dorian Williams, I think, has a shot to compete for a meaning meaningful role on defense. Justin Shorter, I love the fact that he's going to be a four-phase special teamer. 
And there's no risk of him being on the practice squad because he can immediately contribute and grow into whatever he's going to grow into. And the seventh round picks, you know, they weren't my flavor, but at the end of the day, there's seventh round picks. And if your biggest complaint about a draft is what they did in the seventh round, then it was probably a pretty decent draft. We'll know how these players turn out in three or four years. I applaud the process. They went in, they went best player available. They, they weren't just married to needs. Brandon Bean even said he wished he could have gotten a defensive tackle. The value didn't line up. I applaud that. It's not about this year. It's about the next five. And I love the fact that they loaded up on picks for the next year. And I applaud the Bills. I think they did a very solid job in this draft. And, you know, who knows if they get a future Pro Bowler out of this group. Time will tell. But it's not about the results always in the draft because there's just so much randomness and variables that you can't tell. It's about the process. And the process to me was very strong this year. Yeah. Well, I don't even need to step on top of that. I think that was that was beautiful, Josh. That yeah. was that was very, very well said and well done. I fully understand your A minus and in the joke, yes, Nick Broker's D did not actually influence my grade <laughs> yeah. whatsoever. So please, people, do not think that I actually because you know, Josh, you pointed that out perfect. It's weighted pretty heavily to the top there. Yeah. I just think the reason I can't quite give it that A is just the fact that I need to see it first when it comes to Kincaid. I just can't get my head around it. And it's like that, again, it doesn't knock the player. It doesn't knock even the pick feeling very good about it myself. It's just the luxury style ask of it where I need to know that Dorsey sees it the way that we all see it and how great it can be. It's still kind of a potential. It's still kind of an unknown only because of things we brought up earlier in the episode where it's like, I mean, we've seen them bring in other guys that we hope they would have done stuff with and they didn't. So ultimately, I just can't quite push it to that A spot. But I'm with you when it comes to the excitement and just the 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 greatness that comes with thinking or hoping that they finally have kind of reevaluating stuff and just kind of are like, look, we need to get the best at this, the best at this and so on and so forth and do what's best for us when it comes to just taking top of board guys, not necessarily based on any sort of need whatsoever. So yeah, I share all of that. I think that was very well said. And in fairness to your skepticism, like th it's April come September, the bills have to prove to us that they're willing to put these players on the field, which they didn't do last year. It's, it's another, it's Kyer Elam could be very good, but let's not forget the fact that the bills were down to Xavier Rhodes, and they opted to give him a jersey instead of Kyer Elam in a very important division game against New England. So it's one thing to have the process in place and draft the players you think are best. It's another thing to empower those position coaches and those players to grow on the job, learn on the job, and play. Not all of them are going to be starters, but I think Kincaid and Torrens absolutely need to be starters this year for a meaningful amount of the snaps. And if that doesn't happen, I would love to come back and revisit this grade in a year and tell you how I don't care that he was the highest graded player on your board. If Osiris Torrance is spending every Sunday watching Ryan Bates play because he still has to learn the playbook, like they keep saying about Naheem Hines, which is just frustrating, or because Ryan Bates and Connor McGovern make more money, then we're going to have a larger conversation. But the evidence is there that they're changing their process, and hopefully that carries over to having a more open mind when it comes to letting these younger players play. Luca, it's probably going to be a minute before we're back. You have a wedding coming up. I have a wife and kids that I feel like I've been kind of ignoring during draft season. And then just quite honestly, Luca and I love doing this. We, we do. We, this is kind of a dream for us. We we're enjoying every minute of this, but we put a lot of time and energy into the draft content and free agency content. And that was on the tail end of the season. And we were putting out multiple shows a week during the season. And just quite honestly, now that the draft is over, we need some time to decompress and some time to breathe. So what we don't want to do is we don't want to force an episode on you guys every week, just to keep our faces in front of you or keep our voices in front of you, knowing that our mindset is we probably need to be able to put away Buffalo Bills football for a little bit, still keeping in touch with what the team does, but not constantly being in that headspace of they did this. How can we put a show on about this? And, and that's not, I don't think that we're, we'd be going down a path of giving you the best product quality that we'd be capable of. And that's certainly something that we're cognizant of. So 
I don't know when our next show is going to be. We will still be active on Twitter. I would anticipate that Stokes and I will be back on uh, Built in Buffalo YouTube here in the next week or two with maybe some quick hits videos to put put another bow on the draft season. And then it's probably going to be a little hit or miss with, and we'll communicate it on Twitter of when our next episodes will be. But obviously, once we get into the summer months and training camp is around the corner, we'll be back into it every week. Bills chat, Bills chat, Bills chat. But for the next couple of months, Luca, I, I think it's going to be it's going to be a much needed break for us. And quite honestly, I think maybe a much needed break for our audience. I agree. Both of those last points right there. We it's it's not even just about us. It's about everyone else. It's not like we're saying no one needs to listen to us and stuff like that. But also at the same time, no one needs to listen to us in the months of May and early June time where it's like there's nothing really going on. It's not that we could you know, we'd be forcing content. We, we started this podcast a little over a year ago and we did go through those months pretty much on the regular schedule. And I thought we did a very good job when it comes to just keeping things interesting, talking about things that you and I would normally talk about just in that time of the year when there is nothing else to talk about and stuff. And we just kind of reflect on the past, have some fun with it, things of that nature. And we could easily do that. But as you also brought up with things also happening in our lives at this point in time, it just seems like a pretty uh, seamless idea to just be like, look, let's take a step back. Let's kind of take a mental break a little bit here. We have other things going on. We will reconvene when things start to look like they're picking up soon and stuff like that. Cause it doesn't need to be like, Oh, we're in the heat of training camp and preseason week one is now on Friday. It's like, no, we can, we can go back into it once mini camps are going and stuff like that. And we'll get excited again because the roster will shape up a little bit. Maybe another signing or two happens where we, you know, Latavis Murray, I think you brought up earlier, maybe all of a sudden he's on the roster. It's like, what are we going to be doing at running back now with him in there and so on and so forth. So yeah, it doesn't mean we're gone forever or anything like that, but I will say with the wedding coming up and stuff, I'm going to enjoy a little bit of a break and just kind of can dive fully into that and whatnot. I will also say, though, Josh, I will be putting out a Sabres thing here or there, too. Yeah. So it's not like my face is going away forever. If you want to catch that stuff, and as you mentioned as well, you, Stokes, and whatever on Built in Buffalo's YouTube, you can catch us there. So we're not disappearing forever. We're just going to kind of, instead of going 65 and a 30, no no cops are watching, hopefully you're listening, uh, we are just going to go the speed limit here, and we're just going to kind of mosey on through this upcoming future right now before we get back right into it week in, week out. And, you know, we pretty much hit our one year anniversary last month and we have grown so much on Twitter. We enjoy so much interacting with you guys on a regular basis. We appreciate all of you who take in our content and we want to continue to be your one stop shop for Buffalo Bills content. We whether it's built in Buffalo or if you're just Bills chat exclusive, we appreciate the hell out of you and we will be back sooner rather than later, bringing content into your lives. I know there will be a week where I get itchy and it'll be like randomly in the end of May. And I'll be like, you know what? I'm going to go live this Friday night. I'm just going to air out like 30 minutes of thoughts. And maybe Luca will do something with Sabres chat, or maybe Luca and I will both get like the itch for it on a random June day and be like, Hey, we're going to go live. The problem is we just don't want to promise you that we're going to be here every Monday and every every friday like that's just not realistic we need a breather we need to decompress and we need to just you know it's kind of our off season at this point in time and um you know we'll be back better than ever i just stole that from somebody else but back and better than ever mike and mike in the morning is what it sounded like but we will be back we'll be on twitter look for us on youtube and reach out to us on twitter we love talking football with you guys we will see you next time on Bill's chat. I can promise you the next time you see our faces, well, will Luca be married next time they see your face, Luca? No, because you're going to do a Sabres chat. Yeah, so I got Sabres chat stuff. I won't soon, be married yet. <laughs> soon enough. But anyway, again, long-winded way of saying we appreciate you, and we will see you next time on Bill's chat.